Okay, who's ready for some stats practice? If there aren't some words that bring joy to the ears of Year 12s up and down the land, it's let's do some stats practice. But based on the required practical, it, it's going to be a good idea to uh, to go through some of these, I think. So first thing I always like to do in this lesson is to start with a um, cartoon from XKCD. If you don't know XKCD, go and have a look at it. It's uh, science, math, sarcasm, all that kind of stuff. Um, really good uh, web comic. And this one's about the null hypothesis. So the very first thing, which maybe half of you did, or maybe a third of you did in your required practical plan, was talk about a null hypothesis when you were asked about stats. So the null hypothesis, of course, is phrasing everything in the negative. And what I'm going to do now is give you five uh, spurious examples, spurious stories that can be attacked with a statistical test. And you're going to practice pulling out which stat test it is that you're supposed to do and what the null hypothesis is going to be. And thank you to the rest of the biology department for doing this, for helping with this, because there is one example centered around each biology teacher at AGS. Okay, so five examples, five teachers. Your job's going to be to pull out what stat test it is, what is the null hypothesis. Do the maths, but again, you're never going to be asked to do the maths in an exam because doing the maths is easy really the skill is what test are you applying to what and why as we said last lesson that's the skill you're going to try and pull those things out and hopefully get a decent bit of practice in so I say thanks to the biology department for helping out with this uh, let's crack on so example number one the breakfast conundrum here's the story what's the stat test OK, um, we should say actually before we begin on this one, there is a big pause button that will come up at various points during the lesson like this, which tells you when to pause and wake some, uh, work something out. And you should, of course, remember that you have access to all of the stats sheets that you got in the, uh, period nine to help you. They're here on the intranet if you don't have them. If you go to the year 12 bit, A level year 12, and then you go to period nine, PowerPoints and resources, and then you've got all the different lessons, correlation coefficient, chi-square, t-test there, which have in them uh, all of the different sheets that you've been asked to, to look at, which show you how to lay these stat tests out, something like that. That's the one for chi-square test. So I would suggest that you make sure you've got access to those now. Go away, find those, and then we will continue with example one, the, the breakfast conundrum. Go find the stat sheets. Go find them. Do it now. Okay, good. We're going to hope that you've done that and we're going to move on. So, the breakfast conundrum. So, here's the story. What's the test? Mr. Brewer of a morning demands that his rigorous breakfast requirements are met to the letter. If they're not, there's going to be a hissy fit. So, his breakfast requirements. In this morning, this particular morning we're talking about, Mr. Brewer was provided with a bowl of shreddies containing 32 individual shreddies, as well as some of the dusty bits that we all dislike from the bottom of the box, contrasted with three slices of orange. Now, it wouldn't be my choice of breakfast, but, you know, who's to say? While being annoyed at the very presence of the dust, this was not Mr. Brewer's primary concern. His normal breakfast is 35 shreddies and two slices of orange, right? All hell is about to break loose in the Brewer uh, household. People are running for shelter under tables. Now, only a stats test, as he is a biologist, only a stats test designed to tell if the two sets of numbers are significantly different can save us now. What is the null hypothesis for this? And what is the stat test you're going to use? So we've got, we've got shreddies, we've got oranges, and we've got different numbers. We've got two sets of numbers. So you've got the category of shreddies, the category of oranges, you've got a number that he saw or observed in his breakfast and the number that he expected. And if you can't work it out from out from that, then you need to go back and revise your stats more than I thought. So pause, write an L. Hopefully that's all done. Right, let's crack on then. So of course the null uh, is something like there's no significant difference between the quantities of shreddies and orange slices today compared to any other day. So there's no statistically significant difference uh, between the observed breakfast and the expected breakfast. We can also say we're 95% confident, right, that we are 
not seeing a significant difference okay the test is of course going to be the chi-squared test okay looking at frequencies of things in categories so let's work that test through here's the formula again you'll never be asked to do it in an exam but it is important to know how so we're taking the observed and the expected observed minus expected squaring them divide that by the expected add it up and that's your chi-squared value you then compare it to the critical value which we'll get to in a moment so here's the table you got your shreddies, you got your orange, you got your oranges there. We'll work it through together. So O minus E squared, 32 minus 35 square that divided by 35, that goes in the final box. Um, 3 minus 2, uh, all squared divided by 2, that goes in the final box there as well. Add that up, that gives you your chi squared value. So that shouldn't take you very long at all. Do that now. Done that. Excellent. Right, moving on. As we should have been able to easily work out, uh, we, we've got a chi-squared value there. We're now going to compare it to the table here. Now, this is all of the different critical values you could have. You've got your probability values along the top. Okay. Now, we in A-level biology just fixate on this one over here, 0 0.05, that p-value there, basically saying that is 95% confident that these results are or are not significant. Okay. Degrees of freedom for chi-squared is the amount of categories you've got. So in this, we've only got two categories, the shreddies and the oranges. Okay, We take away one, and that gives us our degree of freedom. So our uh, test here is one degree of freedom, 0 0.05. So our critical value is there, 3.84. And these tables, of course, are in the textbook, and they're easily available online as well. Okay, That's where I got that one from. So the null hypothesis, we've said there's no significant difference between the two breakfasts. The calculation comes out at 0.76. Doesn't matter if yours is a bit different because it's not about precision. It's about is it bigger or smaller than the critical value in this instance. Critical value is 3.84. Right, so as we can see, 0.76 is far below 3.84. So the chi squared value is much less than the critical value. So we accept the null hypothesis. There is no significant difference. We're 95% confident that the difference between the two breakfasts is not significant. Mr. Brewer can breathe. There can be no hissy fit. And the morning is saved. Solution, of course, then, is major OCD counselling for Mr. Brewer. Poor Mr. Brewer. Right, that's example one. Example number two, the hairdo occurrence. OK, so Miss Ledbrook likes hair, particularly her own. Now, of course, she is an experienced and skilled biologist, so therefore knows about stats and knows exactly what she wants. Right? She knows exactly what should be done and whether it's good enough uh, to match her requirements. Okay, so she is the hairdresser's nightmare. She's very specific, laser focused. Okay, so she went into a hairdresser's and asked for the following things, and this might be where my knowledge of what happens in a hairdresser, as you can see, uh, is rather limited. Uh, so she asked for 57 highlights, 23 lowlights, and 15 little bows for decoration. She then uh, found that the hairdresser had actually provided her with 42 highlights, 26 lowlights, and 17 little bows that she later decided she didn't like and took out. Regardless, what's a null hypothesis for comparing, you know, are these the same? Okay. What, what is the null hypothesis and what test are we going to use to see if these are significantly different? Right and null, what's the test? Do that now. Nice easy one there really, isn't it? It's clearly a chi-squared test again. So can we be 95% confident that there's no significant difference between the hairdo Miss Ledbrook was provided with and the one she requested? Is she going to kick off there in the... Uh, in the salon are they going to be that weird blue liquid all over the place is she going to go absolutely nuts or is it okay is it what she's after okay so let's work through the process again same equation here here's the table the observed that she, what she got the expected is what she asked for there it is Her o minus e squared uh, you can work that through yourself just like with the first example so do that now please OK, so from that, hopefully we should have got an answer that uh, comes out um, where we can compare it to this table. Now, of course, the difference here is we've got three categories, highlights, lowlights, bows. So that's three 
categories we take away one that is two degrees of freedom so we're looking at this row here we go along to 95 percent confidence or 0 0.05 p value of 0 0.05 gives us a number of 5.99 it's worth noting here as well that we could go up to are we 99% confident, which pushes the critical value higher, right? Or are we maybe 90%, which pushes the value lower, okay, down there to 4.61. So we could even go 75% uh, confident, 50% confident. And as you can see, the, the threshold to, uh, to cross before we reject the null hypothesis gets easier and easier and easier as we go down. OK, so we're looking at this number here, 5.99, but do bear in mind that we can change the numbers or change the confidence. OK, so here's the answer for what you should have got. The calculation, I reckon, came out at 4.61. The critical value at two degrees of freedom, 5.99, which is seen. So that means that the number uh, for our calculation is below that 5.99. So we cannot be 95 percent confident there is a significant difference. Yeah, so we accept the null hypothesis at that confidence value. However, it's worth noting that looking back here at uh, this one here, we've got 4.61, 90% confident. So while we can't be 95% confident, the significant difference, we can be 90% confident. So it's only 5% out. It's a close run thing. So Miss Lebrick's probably not going to kick off with that hairdresser, but she's probably never going to use them again. Right. So, of course, we've worked out a solution for her there. And of course, the solution is the stress caused her to go bald. Example three. So this is what we call the music taste teaser because musical taste matters. So Dr. Clifford uh, claims that he has brilliant musical taste, that he is an aficionado of uh, the musical world. And we're going to find out if that's true. Dr. Clifford has taken 10 randomly selected albums and he's ordered them, ranked them from his favourite, you know, 10 out of 10, given them a rank, a score out of 10, 10 out of 10, down to 1 out of 10, his least favourite. OK, so he's ranked them in order of goodness. This ranking was compared to how actually good they are. Now, we're going to look if there's a correlation between what Dr. Clifford thinks and what's actually better albums than others. OK, so and thereby work out, does Dr. Clifford have good taste? So we've got single album and we've got pairs of data that are matched up. We've got Dr. Clifford's score and we've got the actual score and we've got pairs. So what can we do with those pairs? What's the null hypothesis and what test are we going to be using? Work it out now. OK, hopefully you've worked out that this one, because we can rank, we're actually scoring and ranking things is a Spearman's rank test. So the rank is the correlation coefficient. Yeah. Um, there's no significant difference is the null hypothesis between what Dr. Clifford thinks is good and what is actually good. So let's work that through. OK, here he is. So this is what he reckoned. Uh, so we've got a score of 10 out of 10 for album one. Really like that. Uh, score of one out of 10 for number four. Hated that one. That was rubbish. Um, and then obviously you've got how actually good the albums are out of 10 there. So you should remember how to do this. Use the sheets on the internet to help if you don't. You rank them. If you get ties, they share the value. So if you've got someone that's share that's uh, tied in fifth and sixth, they get 5.5 each because they're sharing an average of 5.6. And then you carry at 5.5, and then you carry on at seven. Okay. So you average and share tied values. So have a go at doing that and working out at least the sum of d squared here, and then we'll go back for the full answer in a moment. Do that now. OK, lovely. Hopefully you've done that. Right. Let's move on. So here's the formula. So that will, that you've hopefully worked out in the table is this part here, the sum of d squared. So we multiply that by six and divide it by the number of samples there are 10 um, times 10 squared minus one, which is 99. So that category there would be 990. And then we do one minus whatever all that was. And then basically it's going to be somewhere on this line. Top tip with Spearman's rank, if it's outside the range of between minus one and plus one, you've done something wrong. Go back and look at it. Around zero is literally no correlation. OK, so you can imagine a graph, scatter graph, X and Y, and all the points are just everywhere. No correlation at all. Minus one is a perfect negative correlation. So there's a right, the graph going down and 
plus one perfect positive correlation your graph shooting up okay now we have a critical value here as well which basically shows us where the significance is and if you're closer to minus one or plus one than the significant value that is a significant positive or negative correlation and if you're closer to zero than the critical value well it's not statistically significant so let's have a look at what it should have been here for dr clifford's scores right so we've worked all these through so we've got our rankings here as you can see there was a tie here you gave seven out of seven you gave seven out of ten to two um to two albums there so they they shared rank four and rank five so got 4.5 each and then we carried on at six same thing happened over here with uh, a number of um, albums that both got nine out of ten okay and um, we had the differences here we squared the differences and we added them up okay that then brought us out to uh, and brought us out to here where we've got six times the number that we got 284 from that table divided by the 990 is 1.72 1 minus 1.72 is minus 0 0.72 okay so that works out nicely now the way you do your uh, critical value here so critical value is uh, 5 point, uh, 0.564 we've got 10 sets of data okay so there's our critical value there um, our, our n number is 10 so there's our critical value at 0 0.05 5.64 so basically dr clifford's um result is on the minus is closer to minus one than minus 0 0.564 so we would say that is a significant because it's outside the critical value negative result we would reject the null hypothesis we say there is a significant difference it's actually a significant negative correlation okay between what is actually good and dr clifford's taste okay what can we say from that though well obviously you know we'd love to say we've proved statistically that he has terrible taste in music but of course who did the ranking initially where did that data come from as i said in the last video nino hypothesis hypothesis nonsense in nonsense out so we can't say it's almost as though this is a subjective thing and some questions can't be answered with stats which returns to our point about the question being all important important however Dr. Clifford did found and is now the only remaining member of the Busted Fan Society. If any of you get that reference, I'll be very surprised. So, next, example four. The Mrs. O enunciation entrapment, because T's matter. Now, this one is spurious. So, I have a theory that Mrs. Omani does a thing that a lot of us do, which is... You know, when you're talking to someone, you put on a voice, don't you? you? You sort of, it's a very British thing. We kind of, we kind of like to make people feel comfortable and we, we kind of do their voice back at them. So I know when I nip back down New Forest, then my New Forest accent comes out like that. And I'm talking to people down from a New Forest. And I think Mrs. Omani's doing the same thing when she's talking to those of you from Redditch. And that is, she drops all of her T's. I have observed this, right? So I have plotted the number of T's used in Mrs. Omani's speech per hour against her distance from school. So when the further away from school she gets, do her numbers of T's she's using increase, decrease, stay the same. Don't, don't ask me about the data gathering for this one. I might not have thought it through. Right. So the null hypothesis. Can we be 95% confident? So we, uh, we, the null hypothesis would be we can be 95% confident there is no significant correlation between Mrs. O's use of the letter T and distance from school. This is, of course, another Spearman's rank. Okay, so let's look at the data. Okay, here we've got her distance from school in meters. Okay, and the number of T's used per hour. So, same thing as last time. Pause the video, work it through. See what you get. <laughs> okay, right. Hopefully you've managed to do that and we can work this, we can carry on. So I reckon it looked like this, okay, that we've got all those different ones there. If you want to pause again and check your numbers are right or check mine are right could be a mistake in there again i know you mathematicians don't like this but with stats it's it's whether it's one side or the other of a number the exact number it doesn't really matter as long as it's there or thereabouts so the process we've gone 
the null hypothesis we can use 95% uh, confident right so we can be 95% confident there's no significant correlation between Mrs O's use of the letter T and distance from school it was a Spearman's rank the number that came out of that table I reckon was 170 6 times 170 divided by 990 is 1.03 1 minus 1.03 is minus 0 0.03 so very 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 close to zero the critical value was 0 0.564 not that we really need it because that's pretty much zero so what we're seeing there is that this didn't pan out at all as a hypothesis there is no correlation really whatsoever in those ones there we definitely accept the null there is no significant correlation between pronunciation and accept and accepting the null mrs omani uses the same amount of t's pretty much wherever she is so what can we conclude from that she's a secret brummy right she's not just joining in with the redditch lot she's a secret brummy right gotcha okay last example finally mr gill's statistical success okay which i think we can all agree this has been one of. So, this is a lovely stats lesson, isn't it? Mm, lovely, lovely stats lesson. And it has been said that my stats lessons are thought to be the finest in the school, even rivaling the great Dr. Proud, should, of course, he ever stoop so low as to, uh, as to teach statistics. So, a survey was conducted to prove my inherent superiority to Dr. Proud in statistical teaching. A survey was conducted of uh, all students who studied both in year 12, asking them to rate both Mr. Gill and Dr. Prowse's statistical explanatory credentials as a simple 1 to 10. 10 out of 10 being fantastic, 1 out of 10 being terrible. And the data uh, results were averaged, and the data is as follows. Okay, so this is what we got. Uh, well, it doesn't look promising, does it? So, question would be, what's the test? What's the null hypothesis? Work that out now, please. Done that. And if you can hear the rain, apologies. It's just started falling really quite hard. So moving on then. The null hypothesis for that would be we're 95% confident there's no significant difference between students' ratings of, uh, of Mr. Gill and Dr. Proud's stats lessons. And it would be a t-test because we've got averages and we've got standard deviations. OK, so here's the calculation, right? That's the t-test calculation. Again, you're never going to be asked to do the calculation in an exam, but you should be able to do it to understand where this comes from. So pause here and have a go. Probably not useful that the pause button covers up the uh, a bit of the data, but never mind. OK, I'm sure you're capable of running this back and finding the data that you need. So what I reckon this came out as, uh, the top row came out as minus 2.9. Now, the minus in a t-test simply indicates the direction of correlation, if there's a positive or negative correlation. And unfortunately for me, the fact there's a big fat minus sign there is not particularly encouraging. So that's the top row, the root of, uh, so basically this one here, look, we've done standard deviation 1 squared divided by the number 50, 50 people were asked. Same with Dr. Proud's uh, squared. The number was, again, 50, same number of people. So the square root of those things comes out as 1.32. So we do 2 minus 2.9 divided by 1.32 equals minus. It's a negative correlation, unfortunately, 2.2. Um, OK, so moving on from there. We've got a larger sample size here. We've got a larger table. So this is our degrees of freedom. So basically, we're adding up all of the people, right? So it's a sample of 50 in both categories. So we add up the samples in both categories. So we're at 100. I think we take two off as well. So it's 90. Uh, so we're up at um, 98 there. So we're sort of down, right the way down here, at around the two mark. Now, really, it doesn't really matter. It's whether it's above or below. So we've got sort of somewhere around two dead okay now critical value two dead calculation of minus 2.2 conclusion the t value is greater than the critical value so we reject the null mr gill stats lessons are significantly worse than dr proud's what a shame so the conclusion there is of course maybe we need more and crazier examples hmm